2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4 is where we begin tonight. That's in the middle of a sentence. I'm going to go back and read the first part of the sentence, which ended our study last week at this time. In verse 3, Paul says, I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Verse 5, longing to see you even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. Now the first question is, what is signified by tears? What is Paul communicating by indicating that uh, he remembers the tears that were shed by Timothy? I'm sorry? When, when, when he left. When he left Timothy to go to Macedonia. Okay, uh, and it could have been any number of different occasions when they parted, but the, the real thought that is expressed here, I think, is uh, uh, the love that Timothy had for the Apostle Paul. And uh, when Timothy's brought to tears to know that he's not going to see Paul for a while, uh, that's got to be very meaningful to Paul, and Paul has never forgotten that. I think sometimes we forget how important uh, our body language is. Sometimes we do a tremendous lot of communication by the expression on our faces, by the gestures of our hands, by the movement of our body, even by the shedding of tears. And tears is a message that sometimes can be misunderstood. I remember well, and I think I've told some of you this, years ago when I and was preaching in a church in Missouri. Uh, at the close of the service, I was greeting the people as they were leaving the building, and one lady was approaching me, uh, weeping, shedding many tears. And my initial reaction was, uh, what has bothered her? Did I say something in my sermon that hurt her? I just knew that uh, something was bothering her because of her tears, and I was wondering, how am I going to deal with this, and what does she need to hear from me? To my surprise, they were not tears of sadness or sorrow. They were tears of joy. I'll never forget it, because she heard something in the sermon that night she had never heard before in her life. And she said, that has changed my whole life. I've been living a lie, and now I know the truth. And I just am so filled with joy, I can't contain it. And it was expressed in tears. So tears do convey many, many different thoughts. In this case, obviously, it's a thought of love that enters Paul's mind as he remembers this. Now, did Paul ever refer to his own tears as proof of his love for others? If you've read that passage that I cite there for you in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, you know the answer is what? Yes, right. Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be made sorrowful, but that you should know the love which I have especially for you. The tears express the genuineness with which that letter was being written and the way in which he hoped by mentioning this fact that they would receive the letter. In other words, here's somebody who's writing a letter. He really cares about what he's saying to them. And he hopes that they'll see that. When John wrote 2nd and 3rd John, both very short letters, he ended both of them the same way. In each letter he said, I have other things I want to say to you, but I'm going to wait till I see you face to face. Don't you understand why? Because there's some things that are best expressed by looking at people, hearing the tone of your voice, seeing the expression on your face, observing the response of the one to whom you're speaking, are they understanding me? Do they have a question mark in their mind? All this is the advantage of person to person. But other times we simply have to rely upon the printed page. That's what Paul is doing here. How does Paul express his love for Timothy in this verse? What does he say that indicates he really loves him? Longing to see you. I think the emphasis upon the word longing, this is something that would mean so much to him. 
He has such a strong desire to want to be with him. Paul really likes Timothy. And I'm sure that Timothy feels the same way about the Apostle Paul. Paul knows that Timothy is a trusted young man. And he's trusted him to be the leader in the church in Ephesus to get things going right. But he would so much like to be there in person with him. Just to see how he's doing. And to see the way in which he's understanding what Paul has been writing to him in these letters. Number four, do we know what Timoth when Timothy shed tears? Well, we've already suggested that it could have been any time when they might have parted one from the other. Let me mention one other thought. Uh, in Timothy's hometown, how was Paul treated? Anybody remember that? They took him out of the city and left him there for dead. He did not receive a favorable treatment at all. And uh, when he was left outside the city as, as dead, I think that uh, on that moment he saw how Timothy had reacted to that. And I think that uh, maybe the tears that Paul saw on that occasion when Timothy was so hurt when he saw the rejection that had been the experience of Paul and the suffering that he was experiencing and the way that people just simply walked away and left him laying there. Number five, Paul uses filled no less than 23 times in his writings. What filling is he speaking of in this verse? Filled with joy. Filled with joy, yes. I think that joy is when two people get together that have been apart and they just love to be together. That's a very joyful moment. We know all that by experience ourselves. So Paul is expressing a very personal thought here in this particular verse as he keeps alive that close friendship and relationship that he and Timothy have together. Verse 5, I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you. He's saying this now about Timothy. Which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm sure that it is in you as well. Now, what do we learn in the only other reference to Timothy's family that we do not learn here? What do we know about his dad? His dad was a Greek, that's right. That's what this passage in Acts 16.1 is going to tell you. His mother was a Jewess, she was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Now, do you know what Paul did to Timothy when he took him as a companion in his missionary journey? that uh, he did because he grew up in a family where his dad was a Greek? Circumcised him. Circumcised him, that's right. If he had had a Jewish father, he would have been circumcised in infancy. But that was not the case, and he was strongly influenced by his mother and grandmother. And Paul then realized that if he's going to work among the Jews, uh, so there'd be no problem created by this, he didn't do it because it's necessary. But he did it as a matter of expediency. What does it mean to do something as a matter of expediency? What does that mean? Something yeah. so they won't get caught up on that. Yeah, it's a case of where you try to do everything in such a way that it won't be embarrassing to the other person or it won't turn the other person off that it'll make it easy for you to communicate with them. Uh, there are a lot of times that uh, we do things not because we want to do it, but because we're concerned about the other person that's going to be affected by what we do. Uh, Paul expressed this another way. He said, to the rich I became rich, to the poor I became poor, to the sorrowful I became sorrowful. In other words, he knew what it was like to laugh with those who laugh, to weep with those who weep, to be concerned with those who have a concern, and he identified with them. And in that way of identifying with them, he was doing what was really expedient. In other words, this is the best way to behave and to speak and to respond on this particular occasion. So what may work in one place may not work in another place. And sometimes all of us, I think, have been embarrassed because we thought we knew a person better than we did. 
and uh, we caught them in a bad moment and we wish we hadn't gone at that particular time because it did not work out well. Number two, was the faith of Timothy's mother and grandmother Jewish or Christian? I think it was Jewish to begin with, but the very fact that Paul now has joined with, I mean that Timothy now has joined with Paul and he's writing this after the fact, don't you think that if Timothy became a Christian that his mother and grandmother probably did too? I don't know how much longer his grandmother lived uh, with them, but uh, obviously, to begin with, it would have been a Jewish faith. But I'd like to think, can't prove this necessarily, but I'd like to think that uh, their faith carried over into becoming a Christian because Christianity is what is prepared for by a correct understanding of the Old Testament. When you understand the Old Testament correctly, then you see that the prophecy in the Old Testament are fulfilled in Christ. And in Christ, we experience the fullness of that as Christians in surrendering our lives to Him. Number three, were Eunice and Timothy Christians when Paul visited Lystra a second time? We read this in Acts 16, 11, Lois and Eunice were godly Jewesses who reared young Timothy in the Old Testament and true faith in God, in the God of Israel. Now, I think that that last part of that sentence would indicate that they had become Christians, particularly when it talks about both the mother and the son, because Paul would not have taken a Jew along with him to be one of his co-workers that was not a Christian, because his whole mission is to try to reach others for Christ, not only Jews, but also Gentiles. Number four, how do we know that Paul had no doubts about Timothy's faith. I like the last part of this sentence. He said, I am what? Sure. I'm sure of this. I think that Paul sensed that in getting acquainted with his mother and his grandmother and knowing their thorough dedication to the Lord, if a boy grows up in that kind of a home with that kind of a mother and grandmother, obviously, that's going to make a real impact upon his life. Uh, a group of us were talking earlier today about how quickly children begin to learn. And the thing that sometimes is forgotten, they begin to learn the first time they see the light of day. And how often uh, we assume, well, they're not old enough to learn anything yet. I remember the story I don't want to offend anybody by this, so I hope you accept it in the spirit in which I'm telling it. I'm just trying to illustrate a point. But there was this young couple that didn't bring their child to church because the child wasn't quite old enough to begin to understand yet. But they had a Catholic babysitter. And one day, the parents with their child were walking down the street, and they came to a Catholic priest, and the little child said, Good morning, Father. <laughs> Now, this is a little child that's too young to learn anything, you see. But the babysitter, Catholic, knew what to tell them and what, how they should address the one that they call Father, you know. Well, there are a lot of instances where I think we have really not started training soon enough. In Catlin, Illinois, years ago, they became famous in that whole area for their cradle roll. They magnified the importance of trying to get every newborn babe in the church building as quickly as possible after their birth. And they assured their parents that while they're being cared for in the nursery, every nursery worker was instructed to say, God loves you. You are blessed to have a father and mother that brought you to church today. And they might have said, they don't know what I'm talking about. They don't know what this means. How do you know they don't? At what point do they begin to learn? Before we realize it. So why not beat them to the punch? Start at the very beginning. All I'm trying to say is, I think that when Paul said, I'm sure of this, knowing the kind of parent and grandparent he had, he can feel pretty confident about this. We, many times, are sometimes pleased and other times embarrassed when we see our children imitate us. Now, they're imitating us when they're doing right, that's okay. But if we're wrong, 
we have to realize, uh-oh, they learned that from me. <gasps> we had my head in shame. Sorry, David. <laughs> That's my son if you don't know who he is. <laughs> But he turned out all right. He's a preacher. He's doing, he's, he's doing okay. He even, he even finally gave in to come with us tonight. No, he drove us here. All right. Couldn't stay home if I wanted to. Number five. In what way does this verse suggest the importance of home? Home is where children are influenced the most, especially at the very beginning of their life. Now verse six. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now he realizes the good start that he had at home, but Paul wants to make sure that this continues, and Paul has assisted in the further growth and development of Timothy through the laying on of his hands. Now remember, the laying on of the apostles' hands was something that was not just what anybody else could do. Uh, the laying on of hands through the laying on of hands of an apostle would usually mean the bestowing of a spiritual gift. They were the only ones that could do this. They had received the spiritual gifts themselves and they through the laying on of hands could impart this as spiritual gift to others. A classic example of this is uh, in the sixth chapter of Acts where seven men of good report and full of faith were selected to help meet a need that was not being adequately met that is to some of the Grecian widows were being neglected in the distribution of food and whatever else was necessary to care for them. And so they chose these seven men to make sure that they were not neglected any longer. And of those seven men, we know that two of them, Stephen and Philip, uh, had received, well, we're told that they, they all received the laying on of hands, but these two men stand out because in the seventh chapter of Acts, we have the sermon that Stephen preached. How could he preach his sermon? He's not an apostle. The apostles and the prophets are the ones that give us the word. Well, they could give a spiritual gift to somebody else. And what were those spiritual gifts? In the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, there are nine of them. One would be knowledge. One would be faith. One would be the ability to perform miracles. One would be the ability to make discernment between right and wrong, true or false. So they had a variety of different gifts that would enable them. Philip went up to Samaria. There was no apostle up there. When he went up there, he went up there and began to preach. Obviously, he must have had the gift of prophecy and the gift of knowledge and the gift of faith to be able to do what he's doing and was very effective at it. In fact, so effective that God says, you've done a good job here. We'll turn this over to somebody else. I want you to go down to the Gaza Road. There's a man going back to Ethiopia that he is reading the Bible and he needs the instruction that you can give to him. So Philip was able to be that man before the Bible was written, the New Testament was written rather, because he had received the spiritual gift. So that's what we're talking about here. Now, why do we not know what this gift of God was other than it was a spiritual gift and an apostolic gift? Why do we know what it is? Because we're not told. That's a pretty good reason, isn't it? The Bible does not tell us that. Now, is there any clue with regard to what the gift of God might have been? I think that there is. I think it's the next verse. Just hang on to that thought, and then you can come back and answer this question when we look at the next verse. Uh, number three, is this gift the same as that mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14? The answer is no. In 1 Timothy, the gift that was given was given by, uh, the, I should say, the laying on of hands that Timothy experienced in the 1 Timothy letter was done by the elders. So the laying on of hands there would relate to his ordination. And we learn this over in the 13th chapter of Acts in verse 1. You remember when they're getting ready to send Paul and Barnabas out? What did the leaders of the church do? They laid their hands on them. They prayed. They fasted. They sent them on their way. This, an ordination is just simply a setting aside of people for a special work. And this is the way that publicly the elders would pray. They'd lay their hands on them, establish a contact. These are the men that we are praying that God is going to use in a very wonderful way as they leave Antioch of Samaria, uh, of Syria rather, and take the gospel to other countries around the world.
which they then did. Now, could Paul have laid his hands on at that same time to equip Timothy, uh, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, to equip Timothy for his work in the Lord? Yes, he could have. We're told, though, in 1 Timothy that it was the elders that laid their hands on, so it wouldn't refer to that gift. It's a gift that he gave as an apostle. So men cannot do this except those who are apostles. When the last apostle died, and when the last person upon whom an apostle laid their hands, what happened to all the spiritual gifts? They're gone. They're gone. Are we <coughs> inadequate today because we don't have them? No. What do we have in place? Scripture. That's right. And we're going to learn before we finish studying this book that all Scripture is inspired by God and will thoroughly furnish man unto every good work. So everything that a miracle does, everything that faith does, everything that discernment does, everything that knowledge does, everything that needs to be done is in the Word of God. And we need to recognize that. Number uh, four, does this verse suggest that Timothy had lost his early enthusiasm? Maybe, but I doubt it. I think he just wants to keep uh, the fires flamed, uh, the flames fired, or fanning the flames. Maybe I'll get this right pretty soon. <laughs> fanning the flames. That'd be the better way to say it. I think that's what he's doing here, just wanting to make sure that, the, uh, that he keeps the fire burning at full blaze. All right, now, number seven, I think, is going to help us to answer uh, the question I asked earlier. Uh, is there any clue as to what may the gift of God may have been? In verse 7 he says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Kind of sounds to me, in light of that verse, that uh, <coughs> Timothy needed a little bit of help. And whatever the gift was, he gave him the gift that would recognize, here's a man that... Uh, uh, has a little bit of a challenge dealing with shyness. Uh, actually, I, I, want, I don't want to try to minimize how serious this is. This word translated timid or timidity is the same word in another Greek form spelled almost the same that is translated coward. Now, uh, Sometimes we refer to people who are afraid as being cowards, don't we? Folks, there's nothing wrong with being afraid. But if being afraid keeps you from doing what God expects you to do, then it becomes very serious. And how do we know that? Well, you come to the last part of the book of Revelation and it talks about all those that are going to be lost eternally. And it talks about the liars and the adulterers and the murderers and and in that same group of people talks about the cowards so Paul is particularly concerned about this problem of cowardice now he's saying that when you serve the Lord God is not going to give you any kind of a gift he's not going to uh, keep you out there in a place where you're going to be so shy that you're hesitant to even let anybody know you're a Christian or to talk to them about what you know about the Lord that they need to hear from you. Now some people are nat naturally more outgoing than others. I'm sure that's true in our group here tonight. There are some people that are more quiet than others. And there are some people that are more reluctant to speak than others. And sometimes it's because of a degree of timidity or shyness that uh, we have a little bit of trouble speaking. I think that Timothy may have been of this nature a person growing up. But now that he's out there preaching, let me go about this another way. Having gone through Bible college myself and then teaching others going through Bible college, I have witnessed many young men that stand up and preach their first sermon and they are scared to death. I didn't know that knees actually knocked until one day I actually saw them 
They they knock. I mean, those old legs are just whoo, man. That's terrifying. Guy was scared to death. I remember one of my classmates got up to preach his first sermon, and he looked out and said, uh, uh, I forgot everything I was supposed to say. <laughs> he sat down. <laughs> well, poor fellow, man, we really so felt sorry for him. But he got up and tried again later on and got through. Uh, sometimes it's not easy for some people. Other people, it's a little bit easier. I think that Timothy probably needed to have a little bit of encouragement along this way and said, Timothy, you need to know this. You may be reluctant to do this. You may be reluctant to tell somebody what they need to hear from you. But you do it. God's going to bless you. That's true, folks. That's true. And uh, I think that that's the point that we need to get here. I was talking to a lady about a month ago that uh, confessed to me that she just was too shy to tell anybody else about Christ. And I thought, well, I need to help you in some way. And so I tried to at that time. I'm going to be given another opportunity to do it uh, sometime next month, I think. But... Uh, We need to recognize it was not easy for Jesus to go to Calvary. But he did. And he had the power to say, you can't do this to me. But he didn't say it. And he knew before he ever got there how horrible the experience was going to be. He perspired great drops of perspiration that were likened unto drops of blood. Praying there in the middle of the night, knowing what faced him the next day. Was that easy? No. And I think one of the things that helps us as Christians to get over our shyness is to recognize if he was willing to do that for me, I should be at least willing to go by and open my mouth and try to say something. And let me tell you something. I've, I've told you this before. I'll not repeat some of my previous illustrations, but I just want you to know, people can tell when you're talking to them, are you for real or not? And they'll sense your shyness. You probably won't be able to hide it. That's okay. You're doing it. And they're on your side. And they're probably going to pay a lot more attention to you than the person who's very glib, like, hey, this is just a breeze. Just... Words just roll, you know. They think, man, he's a professional. I don't need to pay attention to him. Sometimes our shyness can be our greatest advantage. So Paul is encouraging this man, this young man, that may have a little bit of problem along this. He said, God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Why would he say that to Paul? I think that was a problem. And I think he's trying to correct that. But he said, what he has given us is a spirit of power and love and discipline. My, how important that is. So, the meaning of timidity is cowardice, uh, shyness, the temptation to let fear stop you in your tracks. Don't let fear stop you in your tracks. The fearful are not going to make it. The Bible makes that very clear. Now, is there a reason for using a capital S on spirit? I don't think so. Why do I bring that up? Anybody know? Yeah, when the New Testament was translated from the Greek, what was true of the Greek language from which they translated into our language? That's right, everything's capitalized. Now when you put it in English, and you're going to use big letters and little letters, you come to this word spirit. you got a challenge. Is this talking about the Holy Spirit? Or is this talking about just man's spirit? Or the spirit of joy, the spirit of sadness? So do I use a little s or a big s? Now, if it had been a reference to the Holy Spirit, in this particular case, it would have used the article the, T-H-E. That's not used here. Use the letter A. So there's nothing to indicate that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. 
and he doesn't even use the word holy here. But there are some people that think that. I personally think the little s is correct, but I wouldn't want to argue with a person that disagrees with me. Because if you're talking about the Holy Spirit, obviously the Holy Spirit is not going to make anybody timid. But I think he's talking about the spirit that he has that's a result of what God has done for him by the Holy Spirit. In other words, when the Holy Spirit came into your life and when uh, the gifts of the Spirit are yours, these gifts are not given to you to make you shy. They're given to you to make you powerful and brave and bold. Now, is there any room for cowardice in Christianity? No. Not at all. What is the great antidote to fear? Trust. Believe in God. Folks, one of the great testimonies of a person that surrendered to God is in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts and verse 13 when the religious leaders that day took the apostles in prison and threatened them not to preach Christ anymore. Those apostles were with this group of people long enough for them to say, man, these guys are really bold. They are really courageous. And they said that particularly of Peter and John, and they said, they must have been with Jesus. And that's exactly right. Being with Jesus, they realized Jesus did not let anything become a barrier for Him to be a witness to them, to talk to them, to tell them what they needed to hear. And they that boldness had kind of washed off on them too. So they're expressing this. I think God wants us to be bold. That doesn't mean to be brash. Don't misunderstand that. But it does mean you're courageous to the point you'll never refuse to acknowledge you're a Christian. You're not going to be ashamed. You're not going to be trying to hide it. But by the same token, you're not going to be out there in front doing a lot of bragging that's probably going to hurt you because we're humble people. Now, in what way does this verse define the particular manifestations of the indwelling spirit which Paul wants Timothy to demonstrate? These three words, power, love, and discipline, is what Paul wants Timothy to make sure that everybody else sees in him. Now, can you be around a person very long before you realize they either love you or hate you? Uh, can you be around a person very long until you learn about them, whether they are shy or, or they're bold? They're brave or they're timid. In other words, Paul wants Timothy to realize when the Holy Spirit is working in your life as He does in the lives of every Christian, He encourages us to be a good witness. How does the Bible say it? Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. Well, if we let our light shine before men, they, they need to realize there is light in us What's a light? Well, we didn't laugh at their jokes because they were dirty jokes. Does that take courage not to laugh, laugh when all the rest of the guys are laughing? Yeah, it does. But that's the kind of courage we need to have. Speak up or not speak up as the occasion requires of us. Now, what does power do for the Christian? I'll tell you what it did for me. It made me do that. Knock on people's doors. That was the hardest part of the ministry for me as a young man in my first ministry. When I knocked on doors, this is the way I knocked. Did you hear that? Barely. <laughs> Barely, and he's sitting up close. Some of you didn't hear it, did you? I'm knocking. Can't you? Well, you're looking now, but you know when you're on the side door, you, you can't look. You're not all looking up. They didn't have those peak holes back in that day. And when they opened the door, man, that really got me. <laughs> you know, I was all ready to go to the elders and say, man, I've been knocking the doors all day today. <laughs> I'll tell you, they were taking a nap or they must have been away or something. They, they just no one home today. Shame on me. I'm telling you that because I relate to this scripture personally. I think God had me in mind as well as Timothy when he wrote this. God doesn't intend for you to be shy, be timid. 
go out there and make sure they hear it. Now don't knock the door down. <laughs> Avoid extremes. Okay, got to have boldness. God's power does that for us. It really does. When you realize, you know, we've got something the world needs to hear. And they need to know people like us are out there. Even God is emphasizing how important this is. <laughs> All the heavens begin to clap with thunder and say, Preach on, man! Preach on! <laughs> are you listening, folks? <laughs> God just woke you up. Now I've got an audience. All right. Number nine, how do all Christians have this power and love and discipline? Only by the Holy Spirit. And when did we get the Holy Spirit? At the moment we were baptized, our sins were destroyed, forgiven, wiped away, washed away, removed. At that same moment, the Holy Spirit moved in. And now, in this body, which is my home, that I live in, I'm not living alone anymore. Somebody else is living in there with me. Is there a difference between living alone and living with somebody else? Absolutely. Do you have to be concerned about the other person that you're living with? Whether you want to or not, you better be. <laughs> this other person that just moved into your home, you know what he's going to do? When you start to say that thing that isn't true, he's going to say, Hey! Hey! I'm in here. We don't talk that way with me around here. What's he saying? You don't tell lies anymore. You know better than that. I'm here to remind you of that. And every time we have a little bit of problem, the Holy Spirit's nudging us. How does he do that? Through the Word. What is the Word? It's the sword of the Holy Spirit. What do you use the sword for? Stab him. Cut with him. Pierce. Whatever is necessary. And when you read the Word, there are some things in the Bible when you read it, it ought to scare you to death. It ought to shake you out of your boots. Because it's telling you something that you've been wrong. And you need to straighten up if you're going to be the person that God wants you to be. That's what the Word does for us. That's why, folks, every one of us needs to read the Bible every day. We need to pray about it. We need to try to put it to practice in our life. And every time we read the Bible and just step back a moment and say, wow, what did he just say? And let that soak in. You know what's happening? The Holy Spirit is working in your life. And he's using that sword to say, I'm cutting off a part here that doesn't need to be on here anymore. Let's get rid of that. So I'll whack away with the Spirit's sword. Cut that off. Clear the path for you to go down the right path. That's what he's using that sword for. So it gives us direction. It gives us protection when anyone threatens us or makes fun of us. It gives us boldness. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is that which is going to discipline our lives. It's going to help us have power in what we do and to manifest in all things love. Verse 8. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord and of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. My, what a follow-up. Where is Paul when he writes this letter to Timothy? Prison. He's in prison. He's not going to get out of prison. He knows that. Before we get through this letter, he's going to make it very clear to us that he knows that he's going to be killed very, very soon. While he's in prison, he said, I don't want you to be ashamed of me. And by the way, sometimes I think we forget this. What was one of the big obstacles that the early Christians had in spreading Christianity. You're talking a man that was killed as a criminal. He was, you know, put on the center cross between two other criminals as if he's the worst of all of them. A man that the government put to death. And you're following that dead man? No, we're not. We're following that dead man who's very much alive. And the resurrection was the key part. Death played a very important part. They're going to tell the whole story. That's the good news. Yeah, there's one part of the story that doesn't look right. But when you understand what it ha why it happened, then it becomes very right. And it proves that the devil using his greatest instrument, which is death, is conquered by a greater instrument, which is life. So, it's not easy 
to testify for the Lord. It wasn't easy for them in that day. And uh, particularly when they were put in prison. And here's a preacher who was put in prison again and again and again. Not because he was doing something wrong, but because he was doing something right. I'm afraid that there are some scriptures that we have not well understood because I think I'm fair in saying most of, most of us have had it pretty good. But Jesus made it very clear. He said, if you follow me, expect to be treated the way I was treated. If they persecuted me, expect that they're going to persecute you. Has that happened through the years? Yes, it has. Is it happening today? Yes, it is. In various places, in various ways. Have you ever had to suffer for the cause of Christ? Has anyone ever tried to embarrass you publicly because of your Christian stand? Has it ever alienated you from a neighbor or a friend because you dared to be a Christian? You weren't mean-spirited, but you just honestly could not go drinking with them. You could not go gambling with them. You did not laugh at their dirty jokes. You didn't use the filthy language that they used. And they kind of shunned you. A form of persecution. Are we willing to do that? Sometimes people try to avoid any type of suffering at all. That's not what it's all about. He said, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord and of me, his prisoner. Join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Now, whose prisoner was Paul? The Lord's prisoner. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. The Lord's prisoner. Sure, the Rome put him in there. He said, you know why I'm here? It's not because of any power of uh, Nero power of God. That's why I'm here. I could have avoided this by turning against God, but I'm in prison because I dared to stand up for one who is greater than Nero, someone who is greater than the government. What a lesson. What is to be preferred over the shame in the Christian life? Don't be ashamed. Be willing to suffer. Is it going to be easy? No, it isn't going to be easy. There was a popular song a number of years ago. I don't remember the name of it, but I remember the line. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Boy, it sure will. And that's what he's driving home here. How may, Timothy's demonst how may Timothy demonstrate that he's not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord? One way you can demonstrate this is to say, you know... The man that means more to me than any other man that I know of is a strong Christian. His name's Paul. And he's the one that has brought me to Christ and he's the one that's helping me to bring other people to Christ. Yes, he's in prison. Does that make any difference about him as far as I'm concerned? It only makes me appreciate him more because I know why he's there. He had the courage to stand up for what is true. That's what Paul's saying to Timothy. I want you to not be ashamed of me. I want you to be empowered by that. I want you to see in my example that I wouldn't be here if I'd been timid and been unwilling to stand up for the Lord. But I am willing to suffer. Now, are Christians ever in a position that they are proud of Christ but ashamed of His people and embarrassed to be associated with them? I'm afraid that happens at times. What three areas are suggested in this verse in which Christians like Timothy may be tempted to feel ashamed. To begin with, they may be ashamed of the name of Christ. They don't want to be identified with the people of Christ, nor do they want to be identified with the message that Christ wants us to teach to the world. Uh, I think it's Peter who tells us in his letter that we ought never to be ashamed to be known as Christians. Folks, Christian is a beautiful word. It's a meaningful word. It's just simply of saying, we belong to Him. It's, it's so important. 
And so if we're ever in an assembly and people want to know if we're Christians, don't say, well, I hope so, or I think so. No, 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 no. You know you're a Christian. If you obeyed the gospel, you are a Christian. If you're remaining faithful to him, you are a Christian. John R. W. Stott says, we are all more sensitive to public opinion than we like to admit and tend to bow down too readily before its pressure, like reeds shaken by a wind. What do the scriptures tell us with regard to shame? Two scriptures I want to call to your attention. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to tell you everything that there is to know that I know about the Lord Jesus Christ. I know some people rejected Him. I know the government crucified Him. I'm not ashamed of Him because He's not the person they tried to make people believe that He was. Furthermore, I want you to think about Mark 8.38 where we read, Whoever is ashamed of me, this is Jesus talking, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Woo! That ought to put the fear of the Lord in you. The Lord's going to come back. Is he going to come back at a time when you're not expecting him? Well, the Bible says he's coming like a thief. You don't expect the thief, but he comes. Will he find you in a moment when you were a coward? When you were ashamed to be known as a Christian? To be known as one who comes to a study like this? Who associates with Christians? Who stands up for Christian principles? A serious thing. What conditions prevailed in the year 64 AD that would make it a temptation uh, to be ashamed of the gospel. This was the year that Nero set Rome on fire and he blamed the Christians for it. Transferred the blame. Well, my, if, they're, if people are made to believe that they're to the blame, then you might think, I don't want anybody to know I'm a Christian or they might not think well of me. Better think twice when you read what the Bible has to say on that. Number eight, what is the testimony of our Lord? It's the gospel. It's what you read in the Bible about Jesus as you share with others. What did loyalty to the gospel and to Paul mean for Timothy? It meant loyalty to a man who was regarded as a criminal because Paul wrote while he was a prisoner in a Roman prison. Now what is stronger than all suffering? The power of God. This is what makes the witness of a martyr so very important. The power of God, the power of truth, the loyalty to God in the life is so strong, I will die rather than renounce my faith in God. Two men, downtown Oxford, England. To this day, there's a cross mark in the middle of the street. I walked out there one day to look at that cross mark. And I, I just stood there for a moment, knowing that I was standing where two men, Ridley and Latimer, were tied up, doused with oil, and burned to death as a public demonstration. And at the moment that they were tied up and the flame was lit, one said to the other, Master Ridley, be of good courage. Today we're going to light a flame in England that will never go out. And with those words, they lost their lives for Christ. But people are still talking about it today, and I'm talking about it tonight. Why? Because that's a powerful moment. If they'd been cowards, that never would have happened. How many lives have been blessed? by men like that who really believe and they live it and they share it. What two temptations are faced when suffering for the gospel? Temptation is to just kind of give in. Try to 
try to pretend I'm not even here. Just kind of walk away hoping that you're not being seen. Well, you can try to escape it, but you ought not to. But another mistake you can make is you can go out looking for trouble when you don't need to look for it. There are some people that have what we call a persecution complex. They're just looking for trouble and say, hey, notice what a good Christian I am because I got myself in trouble. That's the, miss the whole thing. Miss the whole thing. Father in heaven, time passes so quickly when we're in your word. Thank you for these wonderful people who are here tonight. Thank you that even the rain that you bless us with to clean the air that we breathe, to nourish the soil that provides the food that we eat and the beauty of your creation. Yet it was not a hindrance for us all to assemble, to study your word. God, I am blessed to be privileged to be in an assembly like this. I thank you for every person who's here. I know for some it was not very easy to get here. But here we are. And what a joy. What a blessing. And God, help us to uh, not forget what we talked about tonight. Tomorrow, the next day, maybe even later tonight, we might be placed in a situation where somebody needs to hear from our lips something about you. If that moment comes our way, help us to speak up. Help us not to be ashamed. And help us to rejoice in an opportunity to share you with others. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.